Good evening. On behalf of Avid Learning and the Indian Express, I would like to welcome you to the third episode of Beyond Contemporary Art. The four-part series examines future art frameworks, practices, and publics through introspective discussions through with celebrated artists, curators, gallerists, and practitioners. In this episode titled New Adventures in Art, Ranjit Hoskote will discuss the idea of the artist as contributor and collaborator and look at interdisciplinary art practices and alternative studio concepts through a curated walkthrough of the work of a number of key global artists who have moved beyond the painted or sculpted object and the traditional white cube exhibition space in their quest for new subjects, media, situations, and art making experiences. Before we begin, a few words about our convener. Ranjit Hoskote is a cultural theorist, curator, and poet. He's the author of more than 25 books, including Vanishing Acts, New and Selected Poems, and Central Time. He has translated the poetry of the 14th century Kashmiri mystic Lal Ded as I Lala, the poems of Lal Ded. With Nancy Adajanya, he is the co-author of the Dialogue series, an unfolding program of conversations with artists. With Maria Lavahova, he is the editor of Future Publics, a critical reader in contemporary art. Since 1993, he has curated 30 exhibitions of contemporary art, including two monographic surveys of Atul Dodia, a lifetime retrospective of Jahangir Sabawala, a historical survey of Indian abstraction titled Nothing is Absolute, a survey of 150 years of art by Parsi artists titled No Parsi is an Island, and Unpacking the Studio, celebrating the Jahangir Sabawala bequest on view at the CSMVS now. Ranjit was also co-curator of the 7th Gwangju Biennial in 2008 and was curator of India's first ever national pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2011 and a jury member of this year's Venice Biennale. I'll pass it over to Ranjit. Aleka, thank you so much for that. Catalogue of a multitude of sins. <laughs> and having done all of that, you're still asking the same questions you ever did. And uh, I think that's true of many of us, actually, in, uh, in the art world and those of us who deal with culture at large. So what I want to try and do today is to begin really by welcome aboard. <laughs> to begin by pointing out that you know any any reflection in the future is a hazardous enterprise you know, the shape of things to come is often still the shape of things that were formulated a long time ago and uh, we are part of discussions and debates that are continuous so what i really want to do today is to also offer a set of mappings in terms of uh, artistic positions artistic discussions which continue to be with us today and we'll go through a sequence of what to me at any rate are uh, major departures, major artistic practices that have shaped the things that we today take for granted. So in a way it's, it's a form that my colleague Maria Lavayova who you mentioned refers to as retro prospection. It's looking back in order to look forward so those are not necessarily irreconcilable uh, forms of looking. And one of my starting points today will be uh, a sort of statistical one. As in when I speak on art or talk to people who respond to it, I find that there are two broad um, responses. One is a certain degree of pleasure in the surprises, the shocks that contemporary art can throw up. Uh, there's, there's a degree of receptiveness to whatever might come your way from the studio, from uh, artistic experimentation. But on the other hand, there is a profound puzzlement and even a sense of alienation. And I'm, since I'm on, my own response would be the first, pleasure and surprise and shock, um, I've been fascinated by the, the second kind of response much more. When people are unresponsive to contemporary art, or surprised, or shocked by it, or alienated from it. And I've often wondered why that is. And that's really going to be the substratum of, of, uh, of today's presentation. Because what we have today are a plurality of artistic practices. 
there is, um, across the 20th century, we've had a series of revolutions that have done away with whatever was thought to be sacrosanct, more or less, at the beginning of the 20th century, or actually around the 1880s. And I just want to quote something that the great philosopher and art critic Arthur C. Danto wrote in one of his last books, uh, which is, of course, very simply called What Art Is. And Danto, many of you will remember, was someone who started off with an amazing essay in 1964 called The Art World, where he talked about how more than any other thing, the art world was a set of conversations within institutions that were committed to the making and the discussion of art. So in a way, art is what many of us agree to talk about as art or disagree about. Yeah? So here's, here's Danto, and I quote, Marcel Duchamp found a way of eradicating beauty in 1915, and Andy Warhol discovered that a work of art could exactly resemble a real thing in 1964. And the great movements of the 60s, fluxus, pop art, minimalism, and conceptual art, made art that was not exactly imitation. Now he's referring here, of course, to Plato's idea that the artist is essentially an imitator of some great idea. Oddly, sculpture and photography shifted the center of artistic self-awareness in the 70s. After that, everything was feasible. Anything went, leaving it uncertain whether a definition of art is any longer possible. And I'm going to leave that, or rather start you off with that thought, because many of the things we're going to look at today will, in fact, address this scenario. And I'm just going to signpost a few things that we could bear in mind as a bit of a roadmap to what you're going to see. Many of these artists and practices are probably familiar to you, but we'll try and constellate them in, in, in this kind of discussion. I think fundamentally what happened after, the, after, after Duchamp's 1915 revolution with the urinal, with the bicycle wheel, and all the other objects that he set in motion is that the, the idea that the artist produces an expressive object that is somehow removed from normal experience, there was a kind of shattering of that. Yeah? And the resonances of that act are still with us. I mean, is the artist someone who actually makes an object, charges it with the resonance of imagination, or can the artist be someone who nominates something as art? And if so, why? I mean, are criteria inherent in the art object? Are they inherent in the person and imagination of the artist? I mean, these are questions that, that, that have haunted us for over a century now. But the effect of them has been to move the emphasis away from the object as an outcome, the expressive object as an outcome, and to open our minds up to many, many different kinds of artistic outcomes. Uh, typically, also, we've observed over these, over these many decades that the notion of the studio has changed. It's not only a place where the artist retreats to function in solitude and to process uh, imaginative outcomes. It also takes the form of an intervention or a provocation. It could be something that's based in time rather than space. It could depart completely from an interior and address public space or social consciousness or the landscape, or the land, not the landscape, but the land. We've also observed a continuous immaterialization, therefore, of the art object. And I'll pin these observations to the things that we see as we go along. But fundamentally, I think we've also moved away from a medium-specific understanding of art, which tend tends to be based on the notion that artists produce paintings or sculptures or some something that can be defined in terms of medium and materiality. And we've moved to a more accepting space where we are more comfortable perhaps with works that are intermedia or transmedia or that work across different kinds of materiality or where the body is that which produces the artwork or where artwork is produced out of a certain interaction with public consciousness or where the artist is a contributor or collaborator with other people, and also a range of practices now where the artwork resides in 
processes of research or in the archive or in the collecting of disparate objects. I mean, previously one might have regarded some of these things as preparatory practices towards an artistic outcome. Today we are much happier with looking at art that actually is precisely these, these actions. So it also leads us to, because this is, we are really looking at another avatar of a situation that has been with us at least since the second half of the 19th century. With, we're looking here at a kind of avant-garde logic. We're looking at a situation where the artistic imagination is in advance of the structure of expectations that we have as an audience. So the tug that I, the, the tug between the, the, the interplay between pleasure and perplexity that I started with is actually a function of this in a certain way. Are we as an audience or a public able to bridge this gap? Or do we prefer our own expectations? And therefore, are we suspicious of what artists are doing in terms of their very transgressive activity? Yeah? So it's not necessarily the classical avant-garde of the late 19th century, but there's a glimmering of that logic still with us. It also invites us to reconsider questions like taste or the canon. Because up to a certain point in history, one could speak easily, although it actually was always based on class privilege, one could speak of a certain kind of aesthetic taste. There were criteria that seemed to be widely shared and by which you could judge a work of art. There also was a canon, which was a way of arranging artistic production on a, along a set of values, on a scale of values. But when artistic production escapes your criteria, when it sets up its own reading strategies, there is, it's very difficult actually to, to reproduce the canon in its traditional form. It's also very difficult to figure out where taste can be stabilized. And you have to keep updating your sense of why a particular work of art is current, why certain practices are breaking new ground. So we are looking now also at a kind of post-canonical or a post-taste situation. This also means that as viewers, we are now at a great distance from the traditional or classical viewer as connoisseur, someone who was confident in these certitudes of taste and canon and had acquired a certain ability to judge or to possess discernment. I mean, even these terms, as I say them, I mean, what's flashing through my mind are miniature paintings, for instance. Or, you know, it, seems to, it seems to belong to a world where there, there was a certain interplay between uh, your structure of expectation and the artist's structure of feeling. But with, with the kinds of art that we now know as the contemporary, the viewer is no longer in a position to exercise this kind of viewerly authority. The viewer is much more someone who awaits surprise, who could be a participant in this process, who could be even a user of what is, what is presented. So from the connoisseurial distance, we now seem to be in a position where the viewer is much more complicit with the artist in the making and the completion of the artwork in the act of viewing or responding to it. Yet another um, outcome of this situation is that institutions like the gallery or the museum, the last time we went, I see that many of you were here for the last uh, episode, the Mutating Museum, we talked about how, for instance, in a more traditional or classical vein, the museum was a container of artworks. Also, when we talk about the white cube, in a sense, you're thinking of the gallery as a container for artworks. But through these many revolutions that have taken place in visuality, in artistic practice, institutions today are much more platforms for things that get developed there. And it's no accident, I think, that many, many artists now speak of their work as projects, because these are, in fact, projects. They're not complete works that are simply brought in and installed. They take place often in this ecology of the institution, whether it's a gallery or a museum or public space, a specific site, whatever it might be. And again, in a related move, art world institutions are no longer set away in a timeless kind of space apart from normal life. They, they take their place in a larger and turbulent public sphere with all of its urgencies, with its history of public mobilizations, with its history of ideological pressures, 
then they're no longer exempt. I mean, those of you who were here last time would remember that when the Guggenheim was set up in New York, the early rhetoric surrounding it suggested that it was somehow a temple of the arts. So that notion of the museum as sacred space from being the, the temple of the muses, that persisted right up into the 20th century. But it's very difficult today to have that kind of secular theology of a museum. Uh, it's much more the case that the museum now is a forum, it's an arena, it's an agora even, if you will. And that is how artists and curators are, are responding to it or, or using it. And as many of you are aware, these changes that I've summarized in this rather brutal and brisk way uh, have also taken the form of what we tend to call turns within artistic practice. And, you know, you can easily make a 101 list of this, the linguistic turn, the ethnographic turn, the sociological turn. And at some point you wonder if these turns really take place or whether these are devices of explanation. But I think this device is still quite useful because it shows us that through, through these last 70 or 80 or 90 years, artists have, in their practice, tended to see how the particular limitations, if you will, of the visual arts have been made porous. I mean, how, do they, how are they opened up? Can that be done by reference to language, to discourse? Can it be done sometimes by suppressing what seems to be completely integral to, the, to visual art, that is visuality? I mean, what if you take the emphasis off the image to language? What happens when you look at the embedded politics of language? What happens when you use the body as your primary art-making instrument? Uh, what is the, I mean, there is a performative turn when you, when you take up performance not only as the art of performance, but also the art of presenting a self or a subjectivity within a set of political constraints. These are projects that artists have increasingly taken up. And I'm mapping all this because we will get to the works themselves very soon. But I find it interesting to think of the series of turns as a series of ways in which the visual arts have responded to other disciplines, other discourses, other arts, and increasingly taken themselves out of this kind of specialist, even professional limitation that from time to time people have tried to impose on the visual arts. So I think we could, we could meaning I could, I guess. How does this work? Oh, that's not very helpful. Right, okay. In this opening section, what I want to do is to just speak briefly about four figures who, to me, personally are important. And these mappings, I have to say, are not, an, not necessarily an orthodox set of mappings. They're also a way of looking at what continues to haunt as in this particular case, me as an observer, what remains memorable, what is it that continues to exasperate viewers, and therefore is part of the legacy of the contemporary. So John Cage, as many of you would know, was a composer, he was a music theorist, he was an artist, and he was very close to other practitioners in that amazing moment of the 1940s and 50s in, in the US. He was close to Merce Cunningham, the dancer. He, was, he also knew the work of uh, Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns. And part of his concern was also how to get away from what seems to be integral to his own art. And this piece, for, for 4 minutes 33 seconds, 4.33, uh, was a bit of a scandal in its own time. Those of you who know it already will know that whilst it's presented as a piece for a prepared uh, piano, for a pianist, what actually happens is that the pianist comes up to the stage and sits there for this precise duration and plays absolutely nothing. There's, what you hear is, uh, I mean, we have this from the testimony of those who first heard this piece, heard the piece, is that you have this onrush of bewilderment. I mean, evidently this is someone of whom we have a certain expectation, someone who will play, someone who will therefore, by playing, take her or his place in a canon of performance. 
But in fact, nothing happens, and you're thrown back on your own confusions, you're brought face to face with what it is that you expect as a consumer of culture, and in, in profound ways, it, it suggests a kind of vipassana moment, where you're alone with your thoughts, but you're with a set of people with whom you have certain cultural assumptions in common, and those are being uh, transgressed or denied or contravened in some way. So the next question is, is this art, or what is art? So you can't get away from the question of why this is art if it is. So what might have been an affirmative, pleasurable act also is an act with a critical edge. And that's Eve Klein. I've, I'm also fascinated by the fact that many of these figures who, as critical as they were, also premised their work on a certain kind of mysticism, and I use that word cautiously. Now, Yves Klein, of course, was, uh, uh, he, he was 34 when he died. He was a French artist, uh, very, very active, again, in the post-World War II period. And one of his many departures was to refuse the, the normal ways of developing a painting. So what he tended to do was to use models, and he called them his living brushes. And uh, he perfected and even patented this particular kind of blue, this amazing blue, which many of you will know, Yves Klein blue. And um, it was a performative act that set the painting going, because it was the model, instead of being at a distance and being represented in some way, was the agent of the action, of the making of the painting. And it's through the performance, through the mark of the body, that the painting actually got made. Well, some, not all of his paintings. But again, it was, a, it was an amazing moment where the traditional lines between medium, genre, and so forth, and even technologies of making, were shattered. So in its own time, it was a, it was a radical move. And Klein was, can you see that, actually? I'm not sure you can. Can you? Klein was also a student of the void, as he thought of the central nothingness from which life came and to which it returned. And uh, in a way, he also performed his extreme condition, his condition of being an extreme artist. So this is a photo montage that has meanwhile become part of uh, the legend of, of uh, contemporary art. Uh, Many of you will know that the tarpaulin that would have saved Klein from extinction was taken away in this picture. But what you have instead is this incredible moment in, it's like the opera of the self. It's, it, it has ballet-like grace, and it suggests the artist leaping out into the uncharted and the unexplored. It's also interesting because we so often lose the contexts in which images that become canonical, we lose the contexts in which they first came about. It appeared in a broadside that he published, which was critical of uh, NASA's plans for uh, lunar exploration. And he, he presented himself as an explorer of space. This was his conceit. I mean, looking back, you might think it's an Ilya Kabakov-like conceit. But it was that, that's how he saw himself. So this work from 1960 was also intended as a critique of the space program, which he thought was uh, an expression of human arrogance and hubris, you know. So it, it's, a, it's a very peculiar take on a, a, trust, a trustingness in the void, in the universe, but also the ability to make a certain kind of grand gesture and to bring back to the body, the practicing body, this notion of where and how art gets made. I have Andy Warhol here because um, he, again, through the way in which he rearranged the meaning of his studio, uh, transformed people's notion of the studio as retreat, as place of solitude. It was a hangout, it was where parties were held, where movies were shot, and where things were written, where he met people, gave interviews, and really performed this incredibly public-private life of his. So it was also a certain notion of how to be an artist. It also spoke to his critique of authorship in art, because a lot of the work that got done there was in some sense collective. It came out of conversation. It came, up, it came out of different kinds of specialists working together. 
So, in a way, it restored the dimension of sociality and collaboration to art making. And of course, he also oversaw a very complex set of relationships among the members of the studio, which of course was, uh, he was only being partly playful when he called it the factory. There was also a sense that this is not a place where super special, unique, erratic things get made. There's also a sense of riffing on mass production, such as, as you'll know, whether it was Marilyn Monroe or Chairman Mao or numerous other, or the electric chair, the numerous icons that he picked out of the fabric of what was then contemporary, but presented not as erratic images, but as series of uh, silk screen, serigraph, serigraph images. And he said at one point actually that uh, he didn't care whether people thought that he personally had made it or someone else had. So in a sense, there is, even as Warhol was immersed in the domain of celebrity, of fame, of being public, he had this other dimension of diluting singular authorship, considering how art might emerge from the flow of the popular and how it might be made by various different people. And even if we now recognize the Warhol work of art as a certain kind of signature, it still leaves us with this residual question of what does the artistic signature mean? What is the nature of collaboration? What, what is the exact and possibly equitable relationship among contributors to an artistic process? So in many of these cases, I'm asking you to consider not only the actual outcomes of these situations, but also the kinds of questions that emerged from those practices. And those questions are often of a philosophical or an ethical uh, nature. If we'd had a video of this, it would have actually been perfect. But this is Gordon Mata Clark, uh, who's a figure I've been increasingly fascinated with over, over the years. His father was the Chilean surrealist painter Roberto Mata, who actually presented his work in India at an early uh, edition of the Triennale in Delhi. But Mata Clark, the son, was one of those amazing figures, again, who sort of roared across the New York scene in the 70s and addressed everything that was going, in his view, wrong with that city and with the situation. He trained as an architect, but being of anarchic disposition, he decided that his commitment was not going to be to the pursuit of a late modernist kind of architecture, but that he would look instead at questions of property, ownership, uh, protocol, routine, and embody these seemingly abstract things in, in, in things that were actually quite, quite uh, powerfully real. So a lot of his work got done under the sign of what he called anarchitecture, anar anarchic architecture. He also, uh, there's a series of works where he cuts sections into buildings that are marked for demolition. So in a way, it dramatizes the kind of life that might have been led there. It suggests the possibility of intervening in large-scale processes of urbanization. Uh, this is also the time when New York is moving into its, its, uh, its high metropolitanization. So there's, it, his work also fits into this debate, which is really a very existential debate between people who wanted to maintain their small-scale, intimate sense of neighborhood and community versus the master plan and what it had in mind for the city. Uh, also, I mean, I talked about the building cuts, but one of the other things he did was to set up with fellow artists a restaurant, which was very simply called Food, in 1971. So I like to think that a lot of the works that we've seen in the last 20 years, uh, Rekrit, Nija, and others, look back to this genealogy of um, artists creating a sense of community, of, of generosity, of welcome for fellow artists, and the way in which art could be developed as a social act, not somehow as the act of retreating into the space of art, but the act of going out into sociality in a certain way. And this is from a, this is from a film called Clock Shower, which sort of dramatizes the, the, the enslavement to, to time and to protocol and to routine. which kind of moves us in the direction of, I'm going to now 
develop each of these like small chapters, uh, the various turns that we talked about. I love PowerPoints, it says so clearly what it is, the public turn. And um, I'm going to start with Christo and uh, Jean-Claude, who worked as a couple, uh, although a lot of the early work is credited to Christo. And for a while, I think they captured uh, the imagination of people looking at art across the world. Christo was Bulgarian, and um, his partner was French. And over a period of time, from the 70s onwards, they, they intervened in public space by creating these monumental projects. Left to themselves, they tended to emphasize the, the aesthetic pleasure of, of the project. But if you look at both this and the one I'm going to dwell on in a minute, the wrapped Reichstag of 95, I think it's very clear that they were using these interventions as a way of speaking to collective memory, to looking at possibly repressed contents, to dramatizing what had become somehow naturalized in an urban context. This is the gates from uh, Central Park, New York, which rendered a kind of ceremonial grandeur onto the simple act of walking through the park. Uh, an act which is not only simple, but through the history of that space has been variously pleasurable, dangerous, um, a way of encountering nature in the tradition of wilderness, but also an awareness that this is somehow nature in captivity. But the gates tended to bring back this kind of archetypal sense of what it means to, to take a walk, to negotiate space. And the Reichstag project, which is 95, the wall has come down meanwhile, but it's dramatized a building that had been at the heart of the German parliamentary system, but which had also become symbolic of uh, the Nazi regime, and which for decades after the division of Berlin had been derelict pra practically. It, it, it was very close to the Berlin Wall, as many of you will remember, and nothing at all happened there. So this was a, this was a very intriguing way of somehow bringing it out of this phenomenon of being hidden in plain sight and to draw attention in a way to have citizens interrogate it as part of a renewed debate about power, about authority, about the future of the city. Of course, in no time at all, it was restored to its old status. It is, as you know, uh, the parliament of the, uni the reunified Germany. and. Um, far from being derelict or wrapped up, it now has an intervention in the form of a glass dome at the top by the architect Norman Foster. But in this moment in its history, it serves in a sense as raw material to a particular kind of artistic project. It also becomes a way of, uh, it, it, it allows the artist to speak directly to issues that have either been left simmering below the surface or that have somehow been gathered up into a process of neutralization. So for me, these are, these are works that, that really define this kind of turn towards the public social space, the space of civic conversation. And that is Banksy at the request of my collegium of colleagues here. But uh, why I find Banksy interesting is um, that it, it sets up a very different kind of location for the artist. Banksy, as you all know, is, an, is anonymous. This is an artist who emerges from nowhere. These are guerrilla tactics. There's, uh, at the beginning anyway, in the early 90s, you would find these signature images uh, across various uh, cityscapes in, in Britain. Uh, flower through a is, is particularly intriguing because it's the classic Molotov cocktail throwing gesture of the urban uh, militant. But what's being thrown is this gesture of peace with its associations with uh, pleasure, if you will. But if you graph the career of Banksy, you find that there's been, again, this peculiar logic by which an artist can be anonymous. I mean, we don't even know if it's a single person or a group or 
who exactly they are, or he is or she is. But that hasn't stopped the art market from, in some sense, absorbing part, at least part of Banksy's production. Some of the works have come up at auction. Banksy's also worked in, there's been a film. So I, I, I find it interesting to include this notion of the graffiti artist, the outsider, the anonymous artist in our mapping for today. Because it does away completely with the idea that the artist is someone who proceeds from a definite social or pedagogical location from an art school or within the institutions of the art world. It's also someone who is responding to streetscapes, to the kinds of civil strife and violence and disquiet that you find in the street. So that's, that's why you have Banksy there. And that sort of leads us. And in, in statements that this artist has put out, he or she or they, uh, have spoken of um, how graffiti art marks the resistance of the underclass. So there's a way in which this is a kind of, if you will, proletarian expression or an expression of those who are disenfranchised. And across many of the practices that you will see now, there's also this mandate for art as being an expression of the disenfranchised or the marginalized. That's yet another turn that I'll map today, institutional critique, and you can read that. In terms of location and self-presentation or the lack of it, again, the guerrilla girls are, have something in common with Banksy. We do know that they're a group of um, feminist women artists who were formed by and responsive to the feminist strand in the kinds of civil unrest that, that agitated and transformed Euro-American societies through the 60s and 70s. Uh, but the provocation for the group was really 1985 when uh, MoMA reopened with a new exhibition called the Museum of Modern Art in New York reopened. It was renovated. And the first show they had was called An International Survey of Recent Painting and Sculpture which evidently had not a single woman artist in it. And it's, one thinks 1985 was not that long ago, but evidently <clears throat> unconscious patriarchy was, was clearly the norm. So this was one of the responses that the guerrilla girls got together. Also, of course, guerrilla as in sporadic militant activity, uh, unorthodox military means, but they also presented themselves in public wearing gorilla masks. And that arose, according to one of them, from a typographical error. But it, it serves, interestingly, because it also cuts against notions of an aesthetic premise on beauty. It cuts against notions of what kinds of possibilities or spaces or roles are traditionally assigned to women. And it really questions, I mean, you see it there for yourself. Um, it, it questions the unconscious embedded gender asymmetries and power relations that are just part of the, of the structure of such institutions as museums. And their preferred mode at the time and for a while later was the poster. So again, like graffiti, the poster again is something that comes out of the politics of resistance. It comes out of clandestine, surreptitious political activity. So, and it speaks to a long tradition of uh, informal art, if you will, or not art at all, but forms of urgent communication. So we're also looking at ways in which the art world, the conversation of the art world, opens up to embrace new ways of making. It also opens up to new spheres of activity from which impulses come into the art world. The next two images are from Hans Hacker's work. Hans Hacker is a German artist, but he's lived for the longest time in New York. Uh, Hacker, more or less, was the presiding figure of institutional critique because to him, the making of art also has to do with looking at the conditions in which art is made and exhibited. So this was, this has become a legendary piece. This is what he did in and to the German National Pavilion at the, at the Venice Biennale in 1993. Now, some of you would know that uh, the German Pavilion, as it stands there, was 
actually dates back to 1938. It was, um, it was designed by an architect working for the Nazi regime, you know, Ernst Heiger. And it represents, therefore, that kind of authoritarian, fascist uh, sensibility. So what Hacker did when he was the, the, artist, the artist in the German pavilion for that particular edition was to smash the floor. And it was a, a gesture of violence, it was a gesture of rupture, but it was a way of indicating that there had to be a break with this past. And it, again, as with some of the other work we saw, it's a way in which an artistic project actually takes on and becomes a contribution to an ongoing historical discussion. So in, by 1993, I mean, we're looking at 1945 to 1993, there's been a long history of denazification, the basic law, many, many civil gestures by which the Nazi past has been dealt with, there's been atonement, there's been awareness, and yet, certain reflexes, certain structures, might, uh, certain symbols might yet continue. So in a way, this gesture was intended to reaffirm the need to be always vigilant against fascist impulses. I showed this the last time as well, but the last, uh, during the Mutating Museum, that, but in that episode, <laughs> It was part of a narrative about an, an amazing exhibition that took place in 1970 at uh, the Museum of Modern Art, New York. It was curated by Kiniston McShine, the Trinidadian curator, and it was called Information. He invited artists to make proposals for work that the museum would then co-produce. And Hawkers was one of the most uh, transgressive of them all because his proposal was for, a, for an opinion poll. So again, you're looking at you know, what is the medium, if you want to ask a question like that, what is the medium of this work? I mean, it redefines the notion of a medium because its devices are those of a statistical survey, its makers, contributors, collaborators, if you will, are the visiting public. So they're not coming to see something, but they're actually making it together with the artist and the outcomes are the outcomes of their participation. And the question is actually simple. I'm going to make a mess of saying it, but it's probably up there. It was intended to ask viewers if they knew that Nelson Rockefeller was governor of New York and was on the board of MoMA, was also through the military industrial complex not unconnected with the Vietnam War and that he had not in fact condemned the presidential position on it. So in that one gesture, it was also a, a way of rupturing this notion that viewers of art are neutral that they leave their everyday selves outside and come into the museum to be, you know, edified and transported into some noble and timeless space. It's as though Hakka wouldn't let them do that. They came in and this kind of work would actually make viewers even more aware of who they were as citizens, what kinds of debates they sh would or might be part of and what kinds of pressures were active, and also to make the very clear link between structures of power in society at large, in the polity, and in the museum. So it was also a critique of a certain kind of capitalist system that made institutions like this museum possible. So, hence institutional critique, really. <laughs> Черные ряды, золотые погоны, все прихожане ползут на поклоны, призрак свободы на небеса. Глубоко губей, склоны святой, бегом протестующих без новых конвой. Кто на свете еще не оскорбит? Жителям устрашайте любви! Oh, 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 oh,
Бронишешь башней крестных ос Из черных лимузинов Что у тебя идет проповедник Ты один урод, принеси ему денег Подрягуйся и верить Путина Лучшему богатству доверия В поезд тела не замеет митинга Но протеста с нами, высоте у Марии That's Pussy Riot, which is a group of 11 Russian Moscow-based art, women artists. And I have this here because it's, um, it shows the point at which institutional critique can move right over from the relatively secure space of art and its institutions to the other side, into public space, in, it, into the space of confrontation with, uh, with, the, with the authorities. And it was a remarkably courageous action because uh, this happened in February 2012 when it turned out that you know, as the Putin regime became more and more overtly dictatorial, it turned out that the Orthodox Church was not going to condemn him. In fact, there was a lot of support. So this was a, an action that Pussy Riot staged in the Church of uh, Christ the Savior in Moscow. You saw it, so it needs no further comment. But it's, I mean, it was truly courageous because this meant standing up and registering your protest against a regime that uh, takes no prisoners, or in this case actually took them prisoner because many of them, I mean, they were, they were imprisoned and held without trial and it took a long, long time to, to secure the release of um, of uh, some of these artists. So we're now looking also at a factor of risk because sometimes it seems as though artists or writers were performing acts of resistance or of protest or of demonstration in spaces that are somehow secure, like academia or the gallery or the museum. But those spaces are not as secure as they look. And there also are, sp are moments like this when artists move out of those safe zones and intervene and take the consequences of what they do. So this is, this is to me a certain extension of the logic of institutional critique out of the art world and into a place where you perform yourself as a citizen and also really take the, take the legal consequences of that. Next up, I'm going to discuss the turn to language. And I'm going to begin with two works by Adrian Piper, who was, uh, who was born in 1948. Uh, after these recent, I mean, she lived in New York for a long, long time, but after, as, a, as an act of criticism and protest against US foreign policy, she's moved to Berlin, and that's where she lives. Uh, she's an artist and a philosopher. And through the early part of her career, it was a well-considered conceptualist practice, but at some point she became aware that questions of race were not only ambient, but also very, very personally relevant to her, because she is, she is of African-American heritage, but uh, and this is what she uses in a number of her works. She's light enough to pass, as they say, as white. So she realized that in contexts such as the university or the art world, where one would not normally expect racial prejudice. She realized that racial prejudice was in fact common. It was expressed in casual ways. And people wouldn't realize that, you know, this, it, it's the usual logic of, of prejudice, which many of us are very familiar with in these parts as well. That there's a way in which racial, religious, ethnic prejudice is expressed and then sought to be deflected as joke or, well, not applicable to you because you're our friend. So it's this kind of seemingly everyday social situation which actually hides a deep and deep-seated politics of, uh, of, of discrimination, of violence, which she then took up as her subject. So my calling card one is one of these. Again, 
moves away from the visuality that is the heritage of the visual arts and takes up something else, the comment, the annotation, the address, the commentary. It also took as its context the, the politics of the civil upsurge, the politics of race, the politics of positive discrimination. So all of these are strands in Piper's amazingly complex body of work. And it, in this strand of her work, it's, it's precisely these questions of how someone identifies themselves, what is the nature of ethnic heritage, what is the nature of, um, of social perception. These are the kinds of questions that she addresses. Also in this work, decide who you are. So the dramatizing of prejudice that's internalized, the dramatizing of prejudice as it comes across as hostility, all of this becomes, if you will, uh, her medium. The turn to language actually features three women artists, and the normal gender imbalance seems to have been overthrown in this particular set of choices. This is Jenny Holzer, a body of work called Truisms, which she did from 1978 to 87. Again, there's a preoccupation in her work with the politics of discourse, and she's been fascinated by information systems, how they work, what they encode. The great thing about works that use language is that you don't really have to comment on them. There they are. And there's a way in which works like this actually make you complicit. They make you involved in their elaboration. Because when you read these, it's impossible not to have a reaction to this one way or the other. So these propositions also alert you to your own encrypted prejudices or your, the positions you take, or invite you to reconsider them. And that's Barbara Kruger, who through the 70s again um, and the 80s developed work that riffed off of uh, popular imagery. And there were, like in this work, there's a combination of the advertising photograph and the caption, the aesthetic of the billboard. And if you compare this to, say, Richard Hamilton's use of popular imagery or, um, or even Warhol, uh, or Roy Lichtenstein, you see that the, the reasoning, the artistic reasoning is very different. It's not about uh, using the popular as a source of exoticism, if you will, within an artistic domain. It's also about drawing attention to, as in this case, gender asymmetries to the way in which a certain kind of pedagogy and a way of raising children actually helps reproduce certain kinds of attitudes. So in that sense, this, this, is, this is much more to do with an art of investigation, of interrogation, of critique. There's now a brief section where I want to look at how in many contemporary practices, there's a, there's a way in which sculpture and performance not only come into adjacency, but they become part of the same kind of practice. And this might at first sight seem a bit strange, because sculpture is traditionally premised on stasis, on stability, on the unmoving, and performance, of course, is the exact opposite of that. But I'm going to start with um, Matthew Barney from The Cremister Cycle, which is a set of uh, five feature-length films if you put them end to end, they're about seven hours and all. And they explore this personal mythology of cycles of creation, of potentiality. He essays these different roles. So it, it, it's, it, it emerges in the ground of cinema, but it's also strong, re strongly related to performance. It's also a kind of mythologizing of, of the role, the, the nature of art making. And around these films, there's also an enormous body of residual material, preparatory photographs, drawings, things he's written, 
uh, and sculptures that he's made. So when you think of the cremaster cycle, which gets its strange name from the muscle that moves the testes up and down, so in a way you know, th these are overtly erotic uh, films. And the body of work really looks at, looks at this this zone where desire, potentiality, creativity, where all of these emerge from. So I've, I thought I'd just signpost these because it also points to the ways in which there's, a, and even, uh, there's even a theatrical dimension to a number of these artistic practices where there's, there's a way in which you use the mask or the body mask or the role to insert yourself into another kind of history or to extend yourself. So looking backwards, this has so much in common with notions of masquerade, of pageant, but looking forward, it also speaks to the notions of the avatar, of encrypted identities. So works, works like these, practices like these, tend to move, to shuttle between things that emerge from a more, if you will, classical kind of past and also speak to uh, technological developments of today. In that, in not quite the same mode, Cindy Sherman, from a set of 69 photographs called uh, Untitled Film Still, where she presented herself, this was done through the, through the 70s, where she placed herself through the use of props in scenarios or moments that seemed reminiscent of uh, Italian neorealist neo cinema or American noir. So there was also a kind of theatricality to this project. There was a certain role playing, uh, a way in which the artist placed herself in these ongoing histories of popular culture. And she subsequently used other kinds of photographs with which I'm sure many of you are familiar, the historical portrait, the fashion photograph, the artist as model, the artist as long ago historical personage. It's, it's fascinating to look at all of these as extensions of the self beyond the limits of the contemporary. So again, flashing back to our title briefly, Beyond Contemporary Art, I find it interesting to think of beyond the contemporary as not only as something that's in the mode of what is to come, but also of what has gone before and might be retrieved. And this is a work and an artist that I have here because it speaks to what, at least for me, is an ethical disquiet in certain kinds of practices within the domain of the contemporary. It's called 250 centimeter line tattooed on six paid people. And Santiago Serra is a Spanish artist. And his concern is with labor and the exploitative conditions of labor. Yeah? So you might think that this is something that an economist might be well equipped to deal with and how does one find artistic articulation. He does it again in this extreme form where many of his projects are developed around the hiring of people to play these roles. Uh, in some cases, there's another one, there's a variation on this 160 centimeter line, which is women, which is actually um, sex workers who happen to be addicted to heroin and who are paid in heroin. This, well, this project is from Havana where it, he hired six unemployed people from the old quarter of the city and they were paid a certain kind of wage. So I find it difficult to distinguish here between the critique of the exploitative processes of capital and the artist's replication of these. I mean, I, I think it's possible to argue that the artist is simply replicating this in a way that can't be distinguished from what normally happens. If you dramatize it to this point, so what kind of role is the artist playing here? The, the artist is recruiter, the artist is capitalist, the artist also as someone who is part of these processes of exploitation. Because the afterlife of these projects and these images is in a space of privilege. So. I think this, this kind of practice invites us to ask questions about what we're going to do with practices where artists use people who are not in that sense equal collaborators. 
they're people who tend to play their role and then are, they remain consigned to whatever predicament they're in. So what you have is a reflection, there's a kind of remote reflection of that condition, but nothing changes for your collaborators. So what is, what is your ethical relationship to them is a question that one might ask. In another of his productions, Iraqi immigrants in London were hired to wear protective costume on which polyurethane was then sprayed. So from his point of view, they were living sculptures. And one can imagine what it might have meant to be sealed into this hardening polyurethane. So this, these are, I think, again, these are the kinds of ethical questions that some admittedly extreme forms of practice would invite us to consider. But if Pussy Riot breaks the line between the sacrosanct space of art and the political in one way, I think Sarah's work does that in another. Land art is my <laughs> next stop. Again, a legendary work now, which I'm sure many of you will recognize. Uh, Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty from 1970. Uh, developed in the Salt Lake, in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Now Smithson, as many of you will know, was an artist who was committed to not the landscape as a representation of land, but to the quest of going out into a natural environment and engaging with it and producing work in it. So it remains extremely fascinating how there's a certain rearticulation of sculpture through the use of natural materials in a natural environment. And what is the nature of your intervention there? Is it architecture? Is it sculpture? Is it part of, could it, could it have some affinity with the kinds of practices that ag ag agriculturists might, might have practiced for a long time? So again, it's, it's difficult to define what exactly, uh, what sort of uh, genre or what kind of domain one might invent to place this kind of work in. And also, we don't have it here, but in a sense, like, like Barney or like many of the artists we've seen, what you have is not only this intervention itself, but also the entire corpus of drawings, preparatory photographs, and the act of moving into this landscape, all of which is documented and which becomes part of the corpus of this work. So once again, the emphasis is not on an individual work of art, it's not just this frame, but it's also on the residues of the entire intervention, the entire exploration. So here again you see the beginnings of research-oriented or archive-oriented practice. That's Broken Circle, Spiral Hill, uh, which he developed for a summer festival in uh, Amen in the Netherlands. Where here there was a, a further layer in terms of uh, the participation of viewers. So again, the question here is, is this is clearly not an, an uncommunicative sort of sculpture that you might find in a museum space. It also is part of social life. It invites participation. It speaks to leisure activities. Once again, taking away this notion of the artwork as an uncommunicative object that is sacrosanct. But opening up for the future questions of conservation. I think in the last few years, there's been a lot of work done in trying to restore the jetty, which is, um, meanwhile, given way to ecological processes. It also, works like this also invite us to think about the afterlife of artworks. Because we're used to a certain logic of preservation, of conservation, in, in the institutional context. But what happens in art forms where the works were anyway intended to be impermanent, to return to nature, but have acquired, meanwhile, a certain kind of artistic aura or a historical importance? How do you respond then? Do you, do you preserve them? Do you allow them to, to dissolve into space, time, and earth? And that's the British artist Andy Goldsworthy, some of whose work has been described as taking a wall for a walk who's intervened often in forests, in natural environments, and in, in whose work sometimes we, you sense a kind of robust return to concerns that we thought were properly the concerns of romanticism. You know, I, I think we also tend to forget that 
romanticism was a compellingly political movement in its time, that it had to do with a reaction against industrialization, against the capitalist logic of exploiting nature, of making enclosures of common lands, of moving populations to work in the new industrial economy. So in a way, what you see in Goldsworthy's work is a return to that dimension or that, that aspect of, um, of, of, uh, of the romantic. And also the notion of the journey, of making the journey, of traversing space. There are many things that an image like this does not point to, in a way. But uh, in, in encountering practices like Goldsworthy's or like Smithson's, I think it's as well to remember that you're also thinking about an experiential, a process-oriented kind of art, where the journey towards the making of this plays as important a role as the images that remain of it. Two more chapters as we go along. Documentary experiments, self-explanatory, and here again I wish we had some of the videos, but I'm kind of marking this because Harun Faroqi and Antia Ehman worked for the last few years. Faroqi died recently, unfortunately, last year, unexpectedly. Uh, and this project of theirs, Labor in a Single Shot, spoke to conditions of labor across the world. Uh, Faroqi was, despite the name, he was a German artist, as some of you will know. His concerns through the 60s and 70s and 80s were with a, the renovation of a Brechtian kind of theater and with the essay film and with using cinema as a means of of uh, political inquiry or investigation. And um, in this project with Antje Eamon, what, what he did was to bring together many of the different themes of his work. And um, they brought together a collegium, if you will, of people working in different parts of the world, uh, in Thailand, in India, in various parts of North Africa, where filmmakers were invited to make documentaries about the conditions of labor. Remember that Faroqi had been preoccupied with capital and late capital and what it did to work and to workers. So their concerns with this project were how do people work in, in the era of globalization? What happens in Bangkok or Bangalore or Lagos? But there were certain formal constraints. The, the documentaries could be only of a minute or two. They couldn't be longer than that. And they all had to be in a single take, a single shot, no cuts. And in a way that, that speaks, again, in the retrospective mode, <clears throat> it speaks to primitive, early cinema. And um, Labor in a Single Shot had at its center a, a, a Lumiere film called um, Workers Leaving the Factory. It's one of the earliest films ever made. And um, I find it fascinating that all, this, all these years and decades later, something that was done at the birth of cinema can inspire a production like this, which is collaborative in a sense, which is collective. It is in the nature of an open call. So it, many of the most interesting aspects of this project have to do with how a set of criteria, even a manual of instructions, is sent out, but it's understood, developed, and elaborated quite differently. And you have this incredible archive as a result of snapshots of how people work, what their constraints are, and what their rewards might be. And it therefore is also a, a profound, elaborate critique of, of labor, of sweatshop economies today. And that's Alan Secular, who unfortunately also is no longer with us. Uh, amazing artist whose work straddled writing, photography, film, and also was preoccupied with looking at the conditions of labor across the world. So this is from a huge corpus of work called The Fish Story, which takes up a very particular profession, fishing, and follows it through in different kinds of contexts from, uh, from the fisheries to how things are stored to how they're circulated 
Uh, this was always his concern. Secular was preoccupied with the circulation of goods and of people and the asymmetries between people who controlled these systems and people who worked in them. But he made a really beautiful film some years ago with uh, Noel Birch, the editor, called The Forgotten Space, which similarly looks into what he used to call the, the material and the imaginary geographies of, of globalization and of capital. And the final chapter is research as art. I mean, so much of what we've seen already entails and incorporates a great deal of research. But in these three practices, uh, this, is, this is dramatized to a far greater extent. Ursula Biermann is a Swiss artist. And uh, again, because one of the themes that I'm looking at here is the hybrid practice. People whose work extends across different kinds of ways of making art. She's a writer, but she's also an anthropologist, and she works in film. And a lot of her work has to do with, uh, and the lecture for her is also a form. And through these, through these elaborate researches into questions like illegal migration, she then achieves these very impressive and multi-layered installations. Uh, you're looking at part of one of them, the Maghreb Connection. Uh, but she's also worked on um, the elaborate trade, if you will, of, uh, uh, that, that body smugglers have that moves from West Africa through the deserts up to the Mediterranean and into Europe. Uh, and in recent times, both with the tragedies in the Mediterranean and with the Syrian refugees, you see how work like this is in no way merely academic, nor is it speaking to the indulgence of an artist. It's something that is vital. It, it talks to the shape of our times. And um, when you're in an installation by Ursula Biermann, your sensorium is addressed in different kinds of ways. There are video screens where you can follow certain kinds of circulations. There are maps. Uh, so there's cartographic evidence. There is text. There are photographs. There are videos. There's no, singul there's no single sort of address that, that's being made to you. You're in, in that sense, you're immersed in this particular experience. And again, as I said earlier, for me, complicity is an important uh, trope. You become, in some sense, complicit in the workings of this complex world. You might not always be aware of what role you play in this, in this globalized economy, but work like Beerman's reminds you of the relevance of the butterfly effect, you know, that the fluttering of a butterfly's wing in one hemisphere could translate as a cyclone in the other hemisphere. So, you know, this is the other side of global citizenship. On the one hand, it might give you cosmopolitanism, transcultural travel, and all of this. But on the other side, there are also these deeper complicities and economic asymmetry, political crisis that all of us in some way are part of. There's, there's no way to escape this narrative. Or should I go back briefly? Olaf Aureliasen is, um, he was in episode one of this, of this series. He's a Danish Icelandic artist uh, whose work I refer to often because for me it represents the mode when having moved out of the traditional studio context and intervened in social space, the public sphere, land, and so forth, an artist returns to a renovated notion of the studio. And in Eliasson's case, the studio is much more like an architectural firm. It, it actually takes the form of an office. It's a gathering space for specialists of different kinds, uh, art historians, engineers, architects, artists, and others who come together. And it's, there's also a temporal structure to, to his studio, because there are different projects which are in different stages of completion at any given time. So the thinking is, is, is much more distributed, it's much more collaborative. And many of his works take the form of immersive environments. What you're going to look at is the weather project, which again is built on intensive research into weather cycles, the nature of our changing planetary ecology. And this is from the Tate Turbine Hall.
you'll notice also that um, the behavior of viewers is not the sort of classical behavior one might expect because that's also something that work of this kind does. It removes the distance, the keep away kind of feel that you sometimes have in a museum. And here it's, it's a completely different kind of ethos that's created. So viewers participate quite differently in this particular kind of experience. You can see it. So again, at what point and how do you calibrate what you're looking at remains a question. And I'm going to close with uh, Susan Hiller, who's an American artist who's lived for a long time in London. And she trained as an anthropologist and has always had a deep preoccupation with liminal experience, with paranormal experiences, with memories that might be lost or repressed, which might be of an individual nature or collective. And this work that I'm going to show you, and it's, it's actually a long, long, it's a 220-minute archive of extinct or endangered languages. I first saw it about seven years ago, and it's never left me because the form it takes is of a small auditorium. I mean, it's, a, it's really a kind of sculptural installation. And there's a screen on which you see nothing but you hear. And um, what you hear is this uh, unending soundtrack with these extracts from these different languages. In many cases, recordings that were made by people during field trips uh, very early in the day. And in some cases, that's that's the only evidence that remains of certain languages. I remember particularly a, a very haunting Welsh Roma melody, which sounded exactly like Hindi for obvious historic reasons, but that's not the extract we have here. Ah, nawe kaurja, uri diko kawe, uri kang kai goe kau. O Kaurja, it can move a hammock out of my. It got at a tansy. Tiddy Tameha, it got at an Andre. It got at a Tiddy Tameha, it got at a house crazy. Yaku Kiha, Da Kuba, Nakuba, it got at a canami. Yahuba. If you have a good time, you can't get a good time. You can't get a good time. You Ehe Ure Kawa Hete Kautang Andre Tita Meha Mukaha have a Kamura Yoa Kuba Kumina Ikita Mogu. Three quarter Ita Mi. So trail. So trail. Three. Three. Vuzot. Courtise. Abie. Bull de Tak Tak. Radbo. Radbois. Estropié. Goblet. Choc. Choc. Ravard. Ravard. Fluxion. Halé. Sus-fleur. Sus-fleur. Prends la galerie.
Tapi baik tu hunku kerja tu sih isu apa ni rupanya kena mentah. Tapi mana yang kena mentah tu kuasa. Hei, tu jangan terukah bahu bahu. Ante seru kuing aku, seru kuing aku tu kuasa jangan nak kuing aku tu kau. Tapi kan kau tanam tu kau tu juga tu tu banyak jam tu ante. Jam tu ante terukah bahu aku tu banyak. Tut belula rush, bel na pater and snow jo, an el mana, an el mana dur jo, tad fi gordon. La eneni, utaku muru buai dura, loli gasawi, siruro lakak pura nutup pusta, udo bodau, siruro gagalo ini. Iroro la ako dahil sa waywaro tulo, sa buhay dura ka eh. Oh well, sa irela, ang siroro kukuku malakamay di waywaro tulo, siroro gagalo ni. Buhay dura na ay nedi, buhay dura di na buta ako melo, na ane ako na na ay nali. Di po is buta ako na adi, waywar lalilo ne, zare buta ako mke si kilirilo. Buai dura keto ena ulang marang ke arah ke rudo rudo saya di ne ti nampak seta. Wisu, emas tak kui, iman ne kui. It's staying quiet. It's a shank one. It's got just next It's staying quiet. It's in a song shank one. It's staying open. It's got just next It's staying quiet. It's not song. Stanghun Muslim Oltons Hawkers. She honeyed them at the iron. Ah, not just out, out there, sneak at Stanghu. She asked her, she ate some as quail. Uh, some of the white people now, they claim that there were no Indians here before the flood. They said we drifted from other countries, foreign countries. Now they're just trying to cover up what they're doing now, taking our lands away. Ka yacht ci honitam kaich tut ka aus ko mitna ci chai chai ya naksa ti stangon kuj de zatem shach muje dobra rada je jadna kuj da medalja ma dva boka Vječe su džiči, a vječi je kšiš. Lipje je lipje.
Bonjour, mon vie. Comment tu es? Oh, comme le temps. Et toi? Il faut penser bien. Ton vas tu belle une fin? Oh, pour qui pas. Un bon pain de bière pour mes six pieds. Pakandīt amāt kolm lekštu iļu kāngar randu. Ala astu siendam pēle vanātoķi viedīs aigāmolu piškīst lējist, ku tulma kodāji koriem kubbu jālībad līnagist. Hei! Hello! Or hi! Hei! Kta lenēk sihāķ? Do you speak lenāpē? Taktani, I don't know. Taktani. Kalau ingin ringan we nangkuri wana ngopen angrua warai caru we wandi luku keringkarian rumal pala ngan we ngarin jerayan di ramai nili luku keringkari ngamu we ar tanau merwan ring balan nai ngayola ngamu we pola ngamu we tunggara ngan nyolang ngeratan ngan mali. Tunggara ini ngan we ngan rampa man luku keringkari ini ar ngan ar ngeratan ngan we tunggara ini ngoelan ngan we pola. Misal maksud kukus. Distafian. Wap konos kue. Minat susun god. Nani mua. Sekitar. Ipsuan, kebat sa. Kulit atau kalau kau kau lu tak kuat. Kulit atau kau lu tak nak nana pasti segala nukul mesa sulina. Imesti bani nukul mesa di sana nana papa wedi. And now I will speak the Wampanoag dialect and recite the Lord's Prayer. Ning kanun nishakot kachina tamach kawisawunk. Kat kanan tamuak ni no nina ni kisakat. Ka. Okay. Koka si sakoki. Protect Panoag. Na macha si ong ena nash ni wacha ni na wo. Pakwa wachi mechita.
小布，小布，小布，金，金，金，波，波，波，碾咩，碾咩，碾咩，嘎巴，嘎巴，嘎巴，摸，摸，摸，飞，飞，飞，招面娘，招面娘，招面娘，乖，乖，乖，妹，妹，妹。điếu điếu điếu đam vuông đam vuông đam vuông lo 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 tô 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 ai sẽ chạy qua sự đổ ra ta chỉ về là rồi cái mồ rồi à cô ra về về là đôi vô cái đa sao và cái cái nó đi cam tu cái nó đi Kanto, kana de kanto, manki u velu boro di ves. That's all of it. Ajven, za, sheshe, she, re, she, jawa, she, ashe, saba, zaze, ajven. Erken pulang dia mada gal, tang pulang dia ni lagi patu ajar. Negaya pulang dia ajar, erki je emas kita panjang ni, uga uga adi. Emas kita tak canggah yang na, patu pulang dia ni panjang ni, uga adi. Jaya yoda tak nuat panjang ni. Kau pun bukan jela patu ni canggah yang ni, canggah jela patu majang, patu ni majang ni. Patu, i marsa pun al madai ni, patu, patu majar, bulan dia. Allah, marsa pun al madai ni, kurang kipa madai ni. Kadi ni kurang kipa, majar ni koi papu. Taman ga patu madajam, madajam la jajak tajam, kurang kipi, kurang kipi. Tiyan la, tiyan la, kuragachi pa madai ni Tiyan la, tiyan la, kuragachi pa madai ni Patu, jangan, ni tu lagi kanak Jangan kerasi ni je, je yish madak, kan je yish madak Nat markin kani Kapa kuda mandara An mega jaji Kawagoda megajaji. Paja ya naja. Mandarau, ye ne pebi jon koro. Mata guna mandarajari pebi jon koro. Wari nuku pergi guna le paja ya naja. Guna kai kaje wari kabar ni jadu, kaje kabar ni jangan le payera. Sabes namana sama ayat namani wana et akici nana terasa namani wan hutui ubni tu terasa namani wan hutui na and it means a long time ago all the Comanche people spoke the Comanche language. Now we are all going to speak Comanche again. 
from now on we will speak Comanche forever. Probably not an inappropriate moment to end with because, not the killing of the whites, but the language. Um, because in a way, one of our earlier provisional titles for this episode was New Languages of Art. And in a fundamental way, this is a linguistic issue. It's about learning the contours of a new language of art making or many new languages and of finding ourselves as viewers in a space of translation. So thank you for your attention. On behalf of Avid Learning, I'd like to thank Ranjit for all his insights for the third episode of Beyond Contemporary Art. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Indian Express, um, Tarun, Anand Koenka, and Pavitra Puri for all their support. We look forward to continued collaboration. Do join Avid for our upcoming programs. The next episode of Beyond Contemporary Art, which will be on the 8th of December, and which will cover future publics and art audiences. For more information, our flyers are on the desk on your way out. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>